Take your Bible and turn with to Ephesians chapter 1. Maybe you've already done that. We're going to visit again this morning one last time, Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 14. I noticed on the, uh, the records in there this morning, this is the 43rd study we've had in Ephesians. I divided 43 by 14, and that, the average is we spent three weeks on each verse. And I thought, that can't be possible. These verses would all require more than three weeks. <laughs> So I guess I'm moving through this passage a little faster than I than I had anticipated moving through it. But there's, there's something here in verse number 14 that I, I just I, I just want to enjoy with you this morning. Verse 13, he says, "...in whom also after you you you, uh, you trusted..." Talking about the Lord Jesus Christ through the last part of verse 12, "...who first trusted in Christ, in whom also you, in whom ye also trusted, after that you heard the word of, of truth, the gospel of your salvation." and whom also, after that you believe, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Now, a lot of folks get upset, and we talked to you, I had a whole session on the thing about the after. When he says, in whom you also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, then he says, uh, um, uh, in whom, after you believed, you were sealed. He's not saying, this happened there, and the way over yonder, that happened. What he's doing is giving you the order in which these events take place. In theology, there's a thing called uh, order salutis, the order of salvation. And theologians argue about these things. And should you, do you have to be regenerated before you can believe? Or do you have to be, you know, if you've got to be regenerated before you can believe, then you've got to be justified because God's justice won't give life to anybody that doesn't have perfect. So you get all, and they get all this confusion going. And so then they, then they decide, the theologian's great cop out is to say, it's too complicated, we can't understand. Well, that verse right there is not complicated and hard to understand. You want to see the order of salvation? First, you hear the gospel. Nobody gets saved until they hear the gospel of the grace of God that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and rose again for your justification. And when you believe, after you hear it, you believe it. It's a life-giving message. People say, well, you're, you're dead. This is a message that gives life. Jesus said it in John 5. He says the, the, the hour comes when, when the, the, all they that are in the grave. Who are in the grave? Dead folks will hear my word, my voice, and come forth. You see, there's a life-giving message. That, that book is called, the, 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 Jesus said, the, the flesh profits nothing but the words that I speak unto you. They are spirit and they are life. Paul calls it in Philippians 2, the word of, of life. And that life-giving message, when you believe it, it gives you life. And when you, after you believe it, then the Holy Spirit comes in. And does those wonderful things. He, he circumcises you and he regenerates you and indwells you and he baptizes you. And then he seals you in the Lord, in, 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 in Christ. And you literally are encapsulized in the person of God the Holy Ghost. He lives in your life today to be your seal, your security, to make sure that everything God has given you in Christ is permanently a reality in your life. And you're sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchase possession. And we talked with you last time about the earnest of our inheritance. And I, I told you last time, it was the first time I was back after seven weeks, and I'd never been seven weeks without preaching. And so I was, you know, I had, I had to be, I tried to be, and I don't think it worked too well, I tried to be real disciplined to, go right through all of that. But what I was trying to get at, if I, in case, just so you can remember, is that when he says it's the earnest, it's the down payment. A down payment is a foretaste of what's to come. It's a part of the final thing given up front to guarantee that the conclusion's going to come. When you buy a piece of property, or you buy uh, a piece of furniture, anything you buy, you enter into a contract, you put down some earnest money. You put a down payment down, and that is a foretaste and a guarantee. It's a part of the finished product that the, the, the seller possesses right now to guarantee that the end's coming. The, the, he's the, earn, the earnest of our inheritance. Now, we spend a lot of time talking about our inheritance. That is when we're going to reign with the Lord Jesus Christ in his exaltation in the heavens. You go back to verse number 11. In whom we have, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of Him who worketh all things after the counsel of His own will. Those first ten verses are a description of the counsel of God's will, His plan and purpose to exalt His Son, uh, 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 
uh, and make him the head of all things in a universe, the, the, the heaven and the earth, through the, in the earth through the nation Israel, in the heavens through the body of Christ, but to make Jesus Christ the head of it all, the potentate. You know, the, you ever hear the story about the Tater family? The commentators, the participators, and the potentators? <laughs> You, you never heard that. Uh, you, culturally deprived, I guess. But Jesus, uh, he's the head, the supreme one of all. And you and I are going to be a part. In, in chapter 2, verse number 6, he's raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places. You see, Romans pump focuses on we're, we, we're crucified with him. We're buried with Him by baptism and the death. We're raised to walk in newness of life. Romans is focusing on how you've been equipped to live on planet Earth in the victory that God has provided for you in His Son. Ephesians carries us beyond that. All that is there. But then Ephesians says, not only were you crucified with Him, buried with Him, and raised with Him, but you also ascended up into heaven with Him, and you now sit at the Father's right hand, and you are a participant in the heavenly government that God has put into the hands of His Son. In verse 7 he says that in the, He did all that, that in the ages to come He might show the exceeding riches of His grace and His kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. That's what the reigning with Him is going to be about. It doesn't have anything to do with, with, with you getting a, you know, somebody said, a, I, I want to get a bigger house on a wider street in glory. The other guy says, I just want a little cabin in the corner of glory land. Well, I don't know what you think about all that. But the issue isn't you, it's him. It's that you're going to be a part of the trophy that demonstrates the exceeding riches of his grace. And you'll be a part of the exaltation of his son. And that's what the earnest of the inheritance is about. It's about our reigning with him. We looked at those verses. If we suffer with him, we'll also reign with him. But I tried to make the point to you last time that the reigning that comes out there in the ages to come, you have an earnest of it right now. Come back with me to Romans. We looked at Romans 5 last time. I, I just can't help but remind you about this. This is the kind of thing I can talk to myself about every day. So I can talk to you about it occasionally, right? In Romans chapter 5, the Apostle Paul, the first 11 verses, Mr. O'Hare used to say that the first passage you ought to learn after you get saved is Romans 5, 1 to 11. And I, I, I've said that all these years too. It's the greatest passage in, in, in Paul's epistles on the eternal security of the believer. If you want to understand what the Christian life is all about, there it is in 11 short little verses. Then in chapter, verse number 12, he's going to take up the issue of, in verse, verse 11 he says, not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. That issue of atonement, at one moment with God. Verse 12, he says, Wherefore, because you've received the atonement, now he's going to use a long illustration from here to the end of the chapter, and he's going to use two men, Adam and Christ. And he's going to say, You know, you got a problem. Wherefore, by one man, sin entered into the world and death by sin, so that for that all have sinned. Notice in that verse, for by, death, for by one man sin entered into the world. That word sin is a noun, it's not a verb. It's not the action, it's where the action came from. It's not the fruit, it's the root. It's the, we call it the old sin nature. It's the propensity that, that in every one of us to wander away from God, live independent of Him, and do things our own way. Now where did that come from? Where did that nature originate? One man. And because of that one man, the end of the verse says, So death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Now there's the verb. You're not a sinner because you sin. You sin because you're a sinner. How did you become a sinner? Verse 17. For by one man's offense, death 
reigned by one. You see, we became sinners when Adam became a sinner. All of humanity was in Adam. He was all of humanity. Adam and Eve. Eve came out of Adam so he could be the head. And when Adam sinned, he plunged all of his descendants into the same nature that he had. Genesis chapter 5. You know, people often talk about man being created in the Imago Dei, the image of God. Genesis 5 says that Adam had the sons and daughters in his own image. That image of God has been effaced by sin. And we bear the image of our... And our problem originated because of our sin nature, our connection with Adam. Now, the reason Paul's doing that is because he's going to tell you, uh, you know, it's verse 13... For under the, until the law, sin was in the world, but sin was not imputed when there is no law. The in, issue here is twofold. One, sin got imputed to you. But you know something else that gets imputed to you when you trust Christ? His righteousness. How did sin get imputed to you? Not because of what you did, but because of who you are. Connected to Adam. It was one man's offense, verse 17. By one man's offense, death reigned by one. Much more, they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall, receive, shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one. The free gift came upon all men unto justification. For if by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of who? One. It isn't your obedience that gets you the righteousness of God. That's Paul's point. Your righteousness before God doesn't come because of your actions. It becomes because of Jesus Christ's action in your behalf. You follow that? That's important. That's why he says in verse 21, that as sin hath reigned, how? By one man sin reigned unto death, even so. And that's the whole gist. The, there's a comparison between Adam and Christ. Adam plunged the whole race. His disobedience plunged the race into judgment and death and slavery to sin. The obedience of Christ is where righteousness is found. Not in your religion, not in your actions, but in Him. So He says, even so might the great might grace reign through righteousness. Whose righteousness? Christ. Under eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. And what I want you to see there is that the reigning doesn't just happen out there in the ages to come. There is a reigning in life right now that you and I are privileged to participate in. I love that verse 17 at the end of the verse when he says, they which, re have, which receive abundance of grace, that's the believer, and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Who reigns in life? The believer. You know, when I was young, a young believer, they always said, what you need to do is put Jesus on the throne of your life and let him reign. Let him control. Let him make the decisions. And as I began to grow as a believer, I began to understand this passage. It dawned on me one day. Jesus doesn't say, I'm going to sit on the throne of your life. He says, I'm going to sit on the throne of your life, but I want you to come up here and sit here with me. You follow that? I want you to come up here and participate with me. I want you to understand what my thinking is. I want you to rejoice in what I rejoice in. And I want my thinking and my life to flow and to reign and to control and to rule your life. What a privilege. Just like in the ages to come, we're going to be trophies Show forth the exceeding riches of His grace and His kindness toward us. We have that same privilege of having His life. As we appreciate, as we stand in His righteousness, as we stand in His identity, 
in who He's made us, we're not trying to go about and establish our own righteousness. But we have the righteousness of faith in Him. And He's the issue. And as we take our stand in who God has made us in Him, then His life flows. Your life, when it's brought under the control of the love and the grace of God, that's, where the, that's when He reigns in life with you, through you, in your life. So the earnest issue is there's a reigning coming out there. It's the earnest of the inheritance. By the way, if you look back at Ephesians 1, one of the things being in the hospital and then being home for so long, it was, it was very difficult to read. I, I was, frankly, having a lot of trouble the first couple of weeks I was home out of the hospital just concentrating. But one of the things that you can do when you're laying and, and even can't read, you still think. And teaching Ephesians, is, is, for me, was a wonderful thing because I've read it so many times over the past 45 years that I can just put it up on the screen in my mind. And I was laying there in the hospital bed, miserable as a cook, you know, more than just the walls crawling. We've had some fun about, you know, the, the days I had the walls crawling and the bands walking through my room and that kind of stuff, you know. That was the narcotics that they were giving me for the pain doing that. But when I got beyond that, I didn't, I, I said, I, I, I told them, my family about that, and they're making fun of me. I said, I probably ought not tell them about the projector. <laughs> and I, I just project these, ver these passages in, in, in my mind of the, and just literally just quote them. And as I was doing that, I noticed something in verse 14 I don't think I'd ever seen before, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. Now look over at chapter 4, verse 30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed until the day of redemption. Is that what it said? No. You notice in one passage, it says he's the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. The other place, it says you're sealed unto the day of redemption. Now, the redemption of the purchased possession and the day of redemption are the same thing. We'll talk about that in a minute. But when you say you're, you're sealed unto it, Ephesians chapter 1 is talking about you're sealed, and that seal is going to carry you through all the things that happens in life, and you are secure until you get your glorified body. You don't have to worry. God's going to keep you secure, and you are, you are sealed. On, he's the earnest of our inheritance until the time comes when the purchased possession is redeemed. The day of redemption, it's called. We'll see in a minute. You follow that? So there's a, there's a timing element in Ephesians 1. But when you come to Ephesians 4, it's your sealed unto. Now, there's just a subtle difference here. Here I am over here, and I'm sealed unto that. Now, I've I got to get there, so there's the until. But, you know, I might be going somewhere, but if I don't know where I'm going, I don't know where am I going to wind up. When I'm sealed unto something, he says, here's where you're going. And it's not the time element. It's the identity element. It's the issue of where you're going to wind up. Where am I going? He seals me over here. What's he going to do with me? What's my future? It's the redemption of the purchased possession. So one of them talks about the time element. The other one talks about the purpose. Now the reason in Ephesians 4, he's he, he talking about the purpose of the thing. Look at what he says, verse 29. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth with but that which is good to the use of, the edi of, of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. He's talking about there the purpose for which he's formed the body of Christ, his purpose in your life, in the details of your life, in the relationships of your life, who you are, and what you ought to be about. So the purpose for the, the thing is being focused on there, not so much the timing. In Ephesians 1, it's the timing element. The security element. She so says, until. Now, obviously, you didn't get as excited about that as I did. But I spent a whole morning just really excited in the hospital bed seeing the difference in those things. So, anyway.
I tried. Come back to Ephesians 1. Now here's where we're going to talk. This is where I'm trying to get to. We're the earnest, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. Now you notice that thing about the purchased possession. To redeem something is to make it a purchased possession. When you redeem something, you go pay money. You rescue it by paying off whatever the obligation against it is. So you pay the debt and you purchase it. And now the thing purchased becomes yours. And when he talks there about until the redemption, the buying back of the purchased possession, he's going to redeem that. Now you notice when he says the purchased, past tense, you've already been purchased. It's a done deal. If you look back in chapter 1, Verse 7, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. You're not waiting to get to heaven to have God free you from sin. You're not waiting till you get the resurrection in order to have God forgive your sin, to take the guilt away. That's something you have right now. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 6. This is part of understanding the righteousness of faith. God's grace never works in your life. As long as you're trying to get His blessings in your life and His usefulness in your life based on what you do and what you accomplish. Romans 10, Paul talks about Israel. He says, I bear the record that they have a zeal of God but not according to knowledge. For they going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. It's just not your righteousness, it's His. He's already redeemed you. He's already purchased you. You already belong to Him. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19. What? Know you not? that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? He literally resides in you. Which you have of God, and ye are not your own. Wait a minute. What do you mean I'm not my own? For you are bought with a price. Somebody purchased you. And when they bought you with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. You see, He's already purchased you from the slave market of sin. You are a purchased possession right now. In fact, if you come over to Galatians chapter 3, here's another one of these exciting verses. Galatians 3.13, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. And he did it that the blessing of Abraham, what's the blessing of Abraham? Back verse number 6, even as Abraham believed God and it was what? Counted to him for righteousness. The blessing of Abraham is that God counted him righteous, not on the basis of any works or anything he had done, but way before God ever, way before circumcision, way before any of that, when he believed God. And he had God counted him. And that blessing, that that blessing might come upon the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Now that we're back in Ephesians 1.13 there. You notice verse 13 in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. He redeemed you from sin, but He also redeemed you from the curse of the law. If you look back at verse number 10, For, it is, for, for as many as are, are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. <laughs> you know what the curse of the law is? The law tells you all these things to do, and you don't do them. So what the deal is, 
you're guilty. And the curse of the law is the fact that you can't keep it because you're a sinner. And Jesus Christ came along and redeemed you from the requirement of your righteousness, your good works, being able to be the basis upon which you are accepted before Him. You know what He did? He redeemed you from religion. That's a wonderful thing. He redeemed you from having to have your acceptance before God based on your performance. God's blessings working in your life based on your performance. And He made it all contingent upon that one man and your identity in Him. So when He says, Ephesians 1 verse 13, verse 14, He's the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of His glory. You're already purchased. You're not waiting until over there. But there is a completion of the purchase that's going to take one day, and take place one day at the redemption. Now that's, that's what he calls in chapter 4 the day of redemption. Now that, is, that expression, the day of redemption, is describing the resurrection that takes place at the rapture. The proper name for the rapture would be the day of redemption. Come with me to Romans chapter 8. Another proper name for the day of redemption or the, or the rapture would be the adoption. I tried to say to you when we were back in verse 4 and 5 in Ephesians 1, there's great confusion about this issue of adoption. I, hear, I heard on the radio this morning, riding home from the hospital, a guy teaching and and he says, you know, we're adopted into the family of God. No, you're not. I'm sorry. You're born into the family of God. Adoption doesn't have to do with taking somebody in somebody else's family and putting them in your family. The way you got out of Satan's family into God's family is you were regenerated. You were, became a new creature. You were born. Romans 8 verse 16 the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. That word children means born one. We're born of God. Paul said you have 10,000 instructors, but you have only one Father because I, through the gospel, have begotten you, given you life. What adoption is, is in Galatians 4, he says when a child, though he be heir of all, he's, he's, he's the daddy's kid. And he's the heir of everything one day, but he's under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. In the Bible, adoption isn't taking somebody from somebody else's family and putting them into your family and making him your child. It's to take your child and move him from the status of being, a, being in, in his minority uh, under tutors and governors and putting him into adult status. You follow that? It's important to understand that distinction. You'll never get Romans 8 straight if you don't get that. Verse number 17, he says, If children, <laughs> then heirs. How do you become an heir? You become a child. You get to be born into the family. When you got born into the family of God, you became an heir. Galatians 4. The child, though he be heir of all, yet he's under tutors and governors. He's treated like a servant, but he's the heir of everything. Why? Because he's the daddy's boy. You know how you become an heir of God? You get in the family. <laughs> That's how. You become a child of God. You trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. And it translates you out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of His dear Son. It regenerates you and makes you a part of His family. <laughs> right here is a good place for a song. It runs through my head. I don't dare sing it. <laughs> I'm a child of the king. You know that song? No? Okay. Verse 17. If children then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. You see, when you became an heir, you became an heir of God, and you became a joint heir with Jesus Christ. That's what you are because you're in the family. Then he says, If so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. 
Now, you don't suffer to become an heir. You're an heir because you're born in the family. But you suffer to share in the glorification, the exaltation of the Lord. The exaltation of the Lord Jesus Christ that you're going to participate in is in direct relationship to the suffering that you do now. 2 Timothy 2.12, we looked at it last time. If we suffer with Him, then, we'll be glorif then, then we will reign with Him. So he says in verse 18, For I reckon, and he's going to explain the suffering, that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Now that's the mindset that you have when you suffer with him. How did Jesus Christ suffer? He's not talking about the fact that he had lashes on his back or or, or, or spit in his face, or plucked his beard out, or hung him on a cross, or, or he's not, the, the focus isn't on, on the, the events, the focus is on let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. What was the mindset that he had? Hebrews 12, 2, he says, Who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. What got him through all of that? Doing the Father's will. He stood the night, bowed the night before the, uh, of the cross, and he says, Father, not my will, but thine. You remember that. He said, the flesh, the Spirit's willing, the flesh is weak. He demonstrated what God in human flesh looks like. Your flesh is weak. Your own abilities and resources aren't going to get you there. But the will of the Father, when that's the issue, then there's strength in your inner man, the exceeding riches of his, the power of his word, that gives you the capacity to endure through. And if we suffer, if we think like he thought, he said the sufferings of this present time aren't worthy compared with what the what Father's going to do out there. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. You know what we're doing? All of creation is waiting for the day He liberates it from the curse of sin. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of Him who subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. That's a wonderful prospect, isn't it? Somebody said that the, 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 the history of creation is that God created it and said it's good. It fell into sin and from then on it's been groaning. And one day it's going to be glorious <laughs> when He delivers it. You see, we're, He keeps pointing out there to that future out there. Verse 22, For we know. Now here's something you know. One, you know it by your own personal experience. But two, you know it because God's Word says it. We know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Amen? When you're young and your health is vibrant, you can know that verse just because God said it. When you get older and your limbs start to hurt and your eye dims a little bit, you start looking like Brother Benny, I mean, then you know it by experience. But the experience is true because it's confirming what God's Word said. And that's an important thing because we know why the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain. It isn't because God's mad at us. It's because there's a curse of sin. There's the bondage of corruption on creation. You know how liberating that is? You know how many people today... Preachers today, Christians today, moms and dads, and look at life and they see difficulties and they think it's because God doesn't love them. I stood by the bedside of moms and dads holding precious little lifeless forms of their babies in, the, in their arm and weep over the death of a, of a, of a six-hour uh, 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 old child and look up at me and say, Brother Rick, what did I do to make God do that? little boy called me on the telephone. He says, Brother Jordan, i got a question. I said, okay. He said, why did 
What was God trying to teach me by killing my nine-year-old brother? You know how warped that is? But that's the way people think. That's the way religion teaches you to think. That everything that God does is based upon your performance. Grace tells you nothing that God's doing is based on your performance. It's all based on Christ. <laughs> doesn't mean your performance doesn't matter. It just means it isn't the way God, it isn't the basis on which God deals with you. Well, you let that sink down in you. You let the grace reign through righteousness in your life. And you know something about reigning with Him right now, just like you're going to reign with Him in the future. Not only verse 27, not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the... It isn't just that the lost... People tell you, that's just the lost world out there that suffers. Us Christians, well, we don't get it. See the yo-yo on the TV this past week? That's been the past month or so. I don't know how he gets back on there. He's got little bottles of holy water. Call in and get your body holy water and sprinkle that around your, your living room and miraculously your bank account will be full. The gout and rheumatism will disappear. No, I mean, it's right. I mean, this guy's doing it right now. Peter Popoff, his own. I watched him on the cable TV this past week. Shameful. He's the guy that back in the 80s, Johnny Carson exposed. You remember? Had a movie about it. The Amazing Randy, the magician, atheist, went to Popoff's meeting, and Popoff had this stick that he would do about, uh, uh, he, he'd call a name, Ed. There's, Ed's here somewhere. And Ed's got some problems with his heart. Where's Ed? Where's Ed? Ed stood his hand up, see? Had a word of knowledge. How do you know that? Ed, have we met? No. Have we talked about this? No. How do you know about it? Well, it turned out he had a little, he had a little microphone in his ear talking to the control room. And the amazing Randy took a FM radio and found the frequency. And God talking to him turned out to be his wife. Now, I mean, some of us have that idea about our wife anyway. But what would happen is before people would get there, they'd give out prayer cards, and Ed would fill out a prayer card and ask prayer for his heart condition. She's going through them back there, reading them and, say, and, and giving the name to him, and he's making out like God's. You know what that is? Well, you know what it is. And the gullibility, the stupidity, the, the spiritual blindness of the church today is to let that guy back on TV, on Christian television stations, peddling water to make your bank account go. I mean, it's just stupid. It's just magic. I mean, the guy's like Houdini. It's just a magic. It's just it's the occult. Wrapped in the name of Christ. Now, that was a commercial. That didn't cost you anything. That was an aside that I... I've had my one rabbit trail today. I get two every message, but that's one. But it's not just the lost world. Not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. We ourselves groan within ourselves. Right after I came to Chicago, radio station down on the south side, down on the Grange. That's, in fact, we used to be on that station back in the 80s. I forgot now what the number was. But they, they asked, would you come and debate this man from the this charismatic healer guy. The guy's been down in South America and healing people and done all this stuff. And so sat there at the radio station and talking with him and kept reading that verse. Not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves. If it's God's will that no Christian have any suffering in his physical body, what's that verse about? He said, well, I went to the hospital and there was this brother in the hospital and, and, and he, was, he was dying of cancer and I went in there and I, he, I prayed and God healed him. I said, what happened to him? He said, well, two days later he died. <laughs> and we're on the radio now. And you said, well, then, if he died, you healed him and he died. What's that about? He said, well, God healed him so that he could die in peace. 
Listen, you can excuse any kind of baloney you want to excuse it. Do anything you want to to try to make yourself right. But it would be a lot better for you in the long run to believe that verse. Because there's a type of suffering that honors the Lord, and there's a type of suffering that doesn't. Now keep reading. We ourselves grown within ourselves waiting for the adoption. To wit, the redemption of our body. Your adoption takes place when you get your resurrected body. You go back to verse 15, he says, you've got the spirit of adoption. Just like that, earn, that spirit is the earnest of that inheritance out there, that Holy Spirit of God that's in you right now is the earnest, is the activator in your life now of that adopted status you're going to literally have out here. You've got the privilege now of having the thinking process now that you're going to have out there. Why? Because you've got the complete revelation of God in His Word. You have the capacity to think about, the way the, about things the way God thinks about them, understand how He feels about them, know what He's doing, and rejoice in what He's doing the way He rejoices in it, because you have all that information given to you in God's Word. That's why we're not here to entertain you. That's why we talk about rightly dividing the Word so much. That's why we talk about the grace of God to you week after week after week here. It's not because there aren't other things to talk about. It's just because there isn't anything else that life is made of for you and me. And it's that growing and an understanding and appreciation of His Word working where you begin to reign in life. You don't have to wait till you're out yonder to reign. You can start reigning in life now. <laughs> and that bondage of corruption doesn't have to be what runs your life now. And that day of redemption from the present bondage of corruption, the pain, the suffering that we experience, that happens just because he leaves us here. Come with me over to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Works for us a far more exceeding and eternal way of glory. Tribulation works patience and patience experience and experience hope. Now hold on to Romans because we're going to go back there. Don't, don't, leave, don't let go of Romans. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 16. For this cause we faint not. But through our, though our outward man perish, yet our inward man is renewed day by day. People ask me all the time, Brother Rick, do you pray for sick people? I say, well, duh. I sure prayed for myself when I was sick. Why wouldn't I pray for you? The question isn't do you pray for sick people, it's what do you pray? You know, that verse tells you what to pray. It says your outward man is perishing. You know why my heart valve went bad and had to replace it? And the root going into it? Because I live in a body that's degenerated, that's headed for a, ma a pile of maggots, carnal for the maggots, and headed back to the dirt. Why? The curse, of, the bondage of corruption. Understand that. You understand it. I broke my glasses last week. These are my ones I had before that. That's where I got when I got the shiner. And... I had to go buy new glasses, and they said, oh, you got cataracts coming. I said, he told me that last time. She said, but they're bigger now. I said, <laughs> duh, what, what, I think they're going to go away? I mean, you know. You know what that is? That's the bondage. That where man perishes. You don't need to pray about that. That's the fact. But you know what you pray? The inward man is renewed day by day. You know what you pray for lost people? I'm, I'm sorry, for sick people, you pray that their inward man would be renewed. How's it going to be renewed? By the renewing of their mind, by the Word of God. Explain to them, teach them what's going on, where they are, what's happening, how God loves them in spite of it, and His provisions for them. What are they? Verse 17, for our light affliction which is but for a moment. Now when you're laying there in that bed, watching the wall crawl, it don't seem like a light affliction. And when it lasts day after day, it doesn't seem like but for a moment, does it? But in reality, it is. Works for us a far more exceeding weight of glory. You see, there are things you need to understand about suffering. And if it's nothing but just the... I mean, some of our suffering comes because we make bad decisions. Peter says, don't, when, if you suffer, don't suffer like a, like a fool. But sometimes you make bad decisions. And you have to, I mean, then, then the consequences of that are its own reward. 
Well, sometimes you suffer because of, yeah, all that will love God in Christ Jesus, suffer persecution. Paul told the Thessalonians about that kind of suffering. He said, you're appointed to it. He told the Philippians, he says, it's been given to you on the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his name. You know what the, you know what the intelligized believer's attitude about suffering is? It's something appointed to people who live in a bondage, in a world, in the, a world bound by the bondage of corruption, and it's something we're appointed to. It's a gift from God, really, as a part of our creation. You know, part of it is the fruit of the Spirit. Do you ever think of suffering as a part of, as, as one, one of the uh, parts of the... Love, joy, peace, what's the next one? Long so You know what long suffering is? You suffer long. Absolutely. That verse not talking about deliverance. It doesn't say the fruit of the Spirit is God taking it away. It's talking about God's Spirit producing an attitude of long-suffering in your life that allows you to endure through it. You know, you know what God's attitude toward the world today is? Long-suffering. It begins to let you think the way God thinks about the world that you live in. Go back to Romans 8. Verse 24, for we are saved by hope. Well, I thought we were saved by the gospel. Well, when Christ is, our, which is our hope, this salvation is not initial salvation. This salvation is the day of redemption. Well, we're not there yet. But that prospect of the day of redemption saves us now from despair and discouragement and despondency. And though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day, because we know that... Did I finish that verse a minute ago? I didn't, did I? Yeah, I get to talking. I forget to read the rest of the verse. Our light affliction, which is but for a moment, works for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. That's our hope. We know that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. We know what's coming. That's why I spent 42 weeks on the first 13 verses of Ephesians. Because that's what's coming. While we look, here's what makes it work. Not at the things that are seen, but the things that are not seen. For the things that are seen are temporal, but the things that are not seen are eternal. Because we walk by faith and not by sight. So verse, Romans 8.24 says, We are saved by hope. You're saved from the despair and the discouragement. Whatever the suffering is, debt, desertion, you know, there's, it's fascinating the things people go through. Divorce, disease, death, despair, you name it. We're saved from the destruction of those things in our life, troubling us, by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that which we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. How do you see something you can't see? We just read the verse. Looking not at the things which are seen, but things that are not seen. But the things that are seen are temporal, but the things that are not seen are eternal. Hebrews 11, it says, Faith is the evidence of what? Hung so for. And the substance of things. You get that? Our faith resting in an understanding of who God's made us in Christ. We're homeward bound, folks. And that hope allows our present life to be something that honors Him. And let me say, I said it a minute ago, let me say it again. There, there's a kind of suffering that honors the Lord, and there's a kind that doesn't. Come with me, if you will, to Philippians chapter number 1. 
Paul talks to the Colossians and he, and he talks to them about rejoicing in my sufferings for you. There's some sufferings that he, he's rejoicing in. He tells the Colossians, he says that he prayed for them to be strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. There's people going through with patience and long suffering. It doesn't trip them out. They still have this joy because they, they know the goal. Philippians chapter 1, verse 19. For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Christ, of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. He's not praying to be delivered from death. He said, no matter what happens, I want Christ to be made big, magnified in my body. For to me to live is Christ. And to die, <laughs> kind of a nut is this, is gain. Because to die is to depart and be with Christ. What do you do with a guy that looks at death like that? You know, worst thing you do to somebody that people think is kill them. And he says, go on, shoot. <laughs> Blow me to glory. Paul says, the thing I want is that Christ would be magnified in my body. I want him to look good. <laughs> When people look at me, I want them to see that I cherish Him more than anything else in life. And I tell you that Christ is most magnified when we're more satisfied with Him when we lose everything but Him and He's still enough. He's magnified by Him being cherished and treasured and, and preferred above everything else life can offer. And when we treasure Him above our health and our, stand, and our, and our popularity and our friends and our career and our money and, and, and our status, when we prefer Him above everything else. And how do you do that? By taking His actions and attitudes and making them yours. Taking His words. And letting it be what lives in you. When you're fulfilled in your life, His purpose, that's how He's magnified. It isn't by carrying about a big banner. It's by His, He's talking about being magnified in my body. I want when people see me to know that I treasure Him above it all. You never know if the Lord Jesus Christ is all you need until He's all that you have. And when He's all that you have, listen, then and only then do you really learn that He is all that you really need. Your sufferings, the difficulties, are designed, are used, to show you your weakness. Someone asked me about the open heart surgery. So what did you learn about it? <laughs> and I carried away one, one big thing from it for me. <clears throat> it dawned on me one day that I had become conscious in a way I never had before of my own physical frailty. I mean, they cut your chest open and they open you up pull your heart out, sit it on your chest, start cutting on it. Why do you have a chest? Why do you have a strong? Because this is a box that protects these organs from damage and harm. It's where you're, you're made. They, they cut you open in your abdomen and, and cut. There's, they, they've done study after study of, the, of the, the trauma and the psychology of it, and that kind of an operation, people just go on. But when they cut, cut you open like that, there's this trauma that happens. And what you do is you become conscious 
of your physical frailty and how vulnerable you really are. Listen, when you become conscious of your spiritual frailty, Paul said, most gladly, he said, I, I prayed and asked God to take this thing away. And he says, my grace is sufficient. And he said, most gladly, therefore, will I glory in my infirmities, in my weakness, in my insufficiencies, that the power of Christ may rest on me. That's the exceeding greatness of his power working as. And you know what? It's that day of redemption. He's the earnest of our inheritance until the day of redemption. That day of redemption's coming. And that redemption of our body is there. Our ace in the hole is it's going to be glory. And the joy of it is that all of that that will be ours in reality there can be experienced in our life and lived in our life now. We can reign in life now as we appreciate Him and His righteousness. And when it goes sideways on you is when you begin to try to make it you. When I taught through Philippians Three, I, I, I told a story about the lady that when she died, she was in the co had her body in the coffin and they put a, a spoon in her hand. Remember that? No. Tell it again then. They put the spoon in her hand and people would go by and they'd look and say, what's the spoon? Why the spoon? Kind of odd, you know. And her son was there, and he said, Oh, after we'd have a big meal, Mom always would say, as they clean off the table, Keep your spoon. The best is yet to come. Dessert. My dad used to say, Let's eat dessert first. Maybe we'll die and we'll have to eat the beans. <laughs> well, sometimes we feel that way, don't we? Keep your spoon, because the best is yet to come. If you've never trusted the Lord Jesus Christ alone, exclusively, you're still thinking it's something you can do to be right with God? Could I tell you today just to look to Calvary and see God's love for you? If you've got a heart this morning wonder whether God really loves you, really has your best interest on His heart, really has anything good for you, you want to see the love of God, look to Calvary, where God commended His love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. But Christian friend, He didn't just do it when you were lost and love you. Go to Romans 8 and see where He says that none of these things can separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus either. He didn't love, lost, didn't love you more when you were lost than when you were saved. And it's in Him that we have life and hope. And that hope is what makes us not ashamed to walk day by day in the victory that's ours in Christ Jesus. Father, we thank you this morning for your love and your grace and for our Savior. Amen.